So if you would open up to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. I love what Brandy just prayed, and she prayed, let God be first in their lives. And that's exactly today's message. We sang just these songs today about Jesus, and the last couple of weeks we've been in Psalms, and we've been talking about praising Jesus and praising him for who he is, and no matter what happens here on earth, he's worthy of our praise. And you remember a week or two ago, I mentioned there's two times to praise the Lord, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. So no matter what happens, there's always the time is to praise the Lord. And, and today we sang, I think I saw the word up there, uh, I, I don't know the song, but I think I saw the word reconciliation or redeemed us or called us out of the grave. And today we're going to look at who is Christ and what has he done, and that is the reason he should be first, supreme, preeminent in our lives. He has declared himself the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He has declared himself to be first. The question is, do we make him first? Now, he is first, regardless of what we make. We can't make him anything. The only thing we control is he first to us. And that's our passage today. In these last few weeks, as we were in uh, Psalms 33 and 34, talking about praising the Lord at all times and praising him no matter what, because he's worthy of our praise. I've had several interesting discussions with some folks in the last week or so about uh, who Jesus is. And I was really thinking about that because I wasn't going to be in Colossians today until Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. And I was thinking last week, you know, next week is Mother's Day. And I, I thought I don't want to really start something and then have Mother's Day because we're going to have a Mother's Day service. And I want to start in possibly Jonah when we come back after Mother's Day, May 19th, which is Kelly and I's anniversary. I want to dare forget to say that. Thank you. 34 blessed years. But in any event, um, yeah, thank you. I just, yeah. So, but, it, uh, but as I was thinking about this, what to do, and I was looking at another psalm, and his conversations I had with some folks has come up about who is Jesus and what is he, and, and some conversations I had with some folks that I would have I thought there was no question about who Jesus is. And then I got thinking about do you remember those 12 guys that walked with Jesus 2,000 years ago? And you remember that Jesus asked them, and folks, this is for the followers of Christ today in this world. Who do men say that I am? I've never read that in that context before. I know it in the story. But the church today has to have an answer. When people say, who is Jesus? Why do we, why do you worship him? We have to have an, a distinct and a clear answer of who he is. And of course, when Jesus asked the 12 that, he said, who do men say? He said, some say this, some say, do we live in a world today where some say Jesus was a prophet? Some say Jesus was a great teacher. Some say Jesus doesn't exist, there was no Jesus. Some say the same things of 2,000 years ago is the same question today. And Christ's followers must be very clear you are the Messiah you are the son of the living God that's who Jesus is and as I was thinking on our Wednesday night class as many of you come to Wednesday nights some of you come to Wednesday nights we were, we were going through the book of Colossians and we did this a few about a month or two ago this passage I had mentioned you know this would be a great passage to preach in Sunday morning sometime because this is so good and is so clear this hymn of Christ that's in here in Colossians I said this is something we need to say and folks remember the, the song I love to tell the story to those who know it best who hungry and thirsty who need to hear it just like the rest I can think of no better thing to talk about in life than Jesus and what he's done for me I cannot think of a better topic to talk about all the time. And then I was thinking of Psalm 34, 1 last week where David said, I will praise the Lord at all times. Giving him praise, giving him honor, talking about him, speaking about him, praising him and thanking him. In this passage here in Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to, we're going to really get the meat of it in about 15 through 23. And yes, we will get through it today. 
But I want to start in verse 12, which, and you can read later the opening, the first 12 verses of Colossians, but I'm going to start in about verse 12. Paul was writing about how great God is. <clears throat> and he was saying how great uh, and how he, he, he was never in the church of Colossae. He never met them. But he said, how I long for you, I pray for you, I love you. And he loved them all in Christ. And even though he has never met them personally, and if, uh, if you want, come on Wednesday nights, we're still in Colossians. We can pick some of this up. I'm not going to go through the whole book right now. We're just going to stay in these verses. But he was talking about them. And then he says, I thank the Lord. And then in verse 12, we'll get there. It says in verse 12 of chapter 1 of Colossians, and I give thankful, I give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And we sang that song a moment ago, here in verse 13, how it says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And we just sang that. It says, one of the songs we sang, I saw, I don't remember the words again, but it said, You called us out of darkness and into light. And as I'm sitting here singing these songs today and reading those words, I'm like, I don't know if somebody stole my message or not, but I have to keep note, keep my notes a little more confidential, not on my desk or something. To change the locks on But I thought, this is exactly what we're talking about. He called us out of darkness. I hope that you can remember, or if you think about it, I hope that you have the gift or the grace that God's given you, not only of salvation, but to remember when God said, Jim, and called your name. And maybe you didn't hear it audibly, but spiritually, oh, I was asked last week to tell people, turn your phones off. Let me turn, make, make sure my phone's off. Be, but we had a lot, the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of phone problems in church. I had two or three people this week said, announce to turn people's phones off. So there's your announcement. But in any event, um, that we talk about Christ and his supremacy and his preeminence in our lives, and we cannot make him first to our neighbor or first to our friends or first to our co-workers or first to our students that we work, that the kids go to school with. But we certainly, there's no reason he's not first in our lives. And so verse 12 again, it says, uh, he gives joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified us for verse 13. He's rescued us. From the dominion, the power, the authority, the rule of darkness. And we once were all there. Every one of us were once ruled and reigned over by the devil. And when he said do A, we, we did A. When he said do this, we did it. We had no, no power from ourselves or from the Lord to tell the devil no. We were slaves to sin. And we, and we liked sin. And maybe even as believers, some of us, we still say there's some sin we still like. But we've got to change that completely. And that's the sanctification process. Verse 13, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So now we start, the moment he talks about the son, it mentioned the father just a verse or two above. Now he says, whom the son he loves. And as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there reading this myself, and I've read this probably like you hundreds of times. And I just stopped right there and I thought, Dear Father, thank you so much for the Son. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. The Son of the Father. And I say thank you. As I say this, the next couple of verses, verse 14, Paul through the Holy Spirit writes, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And just like I said when I was studying this passage, I just stopped right there and started praying and praising. The Holy Spirit put that same spirit on Paul because then Paul stops the train of thought he's on. And then the next six, seven verses, he starts talking about the Son. And I can almost see Paul saying, writing this down, oh, this is good, thank you. And they're talking about the Son. Oh, I've got to stop here and praise the Son for a while. And that's exactly what he does here in Colossians. Colossians 1.15, he says, the Son, talking about the Son whom God loves, the Father loves, Here's who he is. The Son is the image, the perfect representation, the perfect icon is the, the he, uh, Greek word, which we get our word icon today. It's iconic. It's the exact same thing. The Son is the perfect image of the invisible God. So God is invisible. We in our flesh cannot physically see God. And God says, I love you so much, I want to show you who I am physically. Well, we can't see that, God. I've got a plan. 
The plan is Jesus Christ. The fullness of God, we'll get there in a moment, will dwell in this flesh that incarnate, and God became flesh and dwelt among us, the incarnation of Christ. He always existed. He was from before the beginning. He was just with God. Before the beginning, Christ always, eternally, forever was and existed. Always. That's one of our principles of faith, our articles of faith. We believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always existed before time began, eternally in the past, eternally, certainly present, and eternally in the future. God will always exist. The Son, Jesus, came into this world 2,000 years ago in the form of a baby. Humanity had sinned. Human flesh sinned. And the only payment for the sin of humanity's flesh was flesh, human flesh. So God said, I've got this plan. I'm going to put myself in flesh. This is a major problem because 2,000 years ago, and even today, people have this notion, the spirit and the flesh cannot mix. The world is sinful, and the spirit is perfect, and the two cannot collide. Baloney, they collided in Jesus Christ. He came physically into this world. God, Jesus Christ, stepped out of heaven and stepped into the earth in a manger 2,000 years ago in a little baby boy named Jesus Christ. And that perfect 100% man, and this is maybe for our minds hard to understand, 100% man, 100% God. 100%. Now people say, how can that be? And I very easily, maybe not a good analogy, but I say I am 100% the husband to Kelly. I am 100% the father of my two children. How can I be two 100%s? We know in our, even in that, those relationships to be 100-100. He was 100% man, just like we are. And he was tempted just like we are. We, oh, no one's been tempted like me. No one's had a harder life than me. Yeah, I know one named Jesus has harder life than you. I know he was tempted just like you are. Yet he was without sin. And he's giving us that ability, and he's separated us from that kingdom of darkness and the dominion of darkness and sin. And he's brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, the kingdom of his glorious light, that sin no longer should reign over or rule over us. It should no longer rule over our souls, our spirits. It should no longer rule over our minds. It should no longer rule over our flesh. That chain has been broken. I work with some uh, men that have addictions, and, and I don't mean, I'm not going to argue here today or parse words, but when they say, well, I have this addiction, and this 12-step program I go to say, I will always be this. I will always be addicted to X, Y, Z. The God I serve breaks those chains. No, I, I don't agree with that. You're not a victim. You're a victor in Christ. I don't like that. You are always going to be this. There's no hope for you. Baloney. If I read this, it says that Christ gives us power out of that. We've been drawn out of that rule and reign and dominion of darkness. We've been given power. We've not been given a spirit of fear. We've been given a spirit of power, and we can tell the devil no. And when he comes and tempts us, we can resist him, and he will flee from us. And we have the power to resist. The Son, the perfect image. And you call, remember when the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus says, are you guys insane? I don't think that's exactly what he said. But he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He declared himself the perfect image of God. Not just a representation, as I said a moment ago. Not, not, I'm looking for the right words here. Not just a facsimile or representation, but he is God. So he said, when you want to see the Father and you look at me, that's who you're seeing. I came here to speak the words of the Father. I came here to do the work of the Father. I do no works of my own. Everything I do is from the Father. Should his other children kind of have that same goal? Should we not be pointing everyone we can towards the Father? In our, in our words and in our actions? Folks, are we going to fall every day? Are we going to slip up every day? But we should always have that bent and that mindset and the goal, Father, make me more conformed to the image of your Son than I was yesterday. And God, I believe, when we looked in Romans, it said that he has begun a good work in you, which of course is salvation, will continue to perform it, which is sanctification. And then, and then it says, until he returns or calls us home, which is glorification. 
And right now, if you're alive and you're a believer, you're in the sanctification process. And in that sanctification process, troubles come, and temptation comes, and testing comes, and hard times comes, and illnesses, and medical, and jobs, and relationships. And he's using all these things that if we are called according to his purpose, all these things are working together for good. If we're saying, God, I'm on your path, and all the stuff going around me is going on still, you're not stopping it, but you are conforming me into the image of your son with, with these things of this world. And, and, and many of you say, well, I don't know if he's working on me. Maybe he's not. If he's not, you're not a believer. You need to get that right today. But if you're a believer, he is working on you because I believe his word more than I believe you. And his word says, he has begun a good work in you. Salvation will continue to perform it. I believe that more than I believe you saying he's not working. Now, I can look at my own life, and if you're a believer, maybe in your life, am I where I want to be? No, I'm not. Are you where you want to be? No, you're not. Are you better where than you were two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago? I would imagine some of us in here, not we're not doing it today, probably never do it, could say, you know what? When I was 21, X, Y, Z. But I not only don't have a desire for that, I have a repulsion to those things now. I used to live for that. Now I'm repulsed by it. You can look at your own life and look back in time and say, you know, God has been working on me. Because the person I am today is not the person I was 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know, I had a lot of people sending me texts about my dad saying, what a great godly man, what an example, what this, what that. I took a picture, I was holding his hand, and I took a picture, he has a tattoo on his arm with a sword with blood dripping off it with his name Bob. He was Marine Recon back when he was 21, 22, 23. And I've asked him about that, and he said, the man I was at 21 is not the man who I met at 86. God has changed me. That's not who I am anymore. That's not the man. And I, and I know people that have spoken to him over the years, and they've given me calls and phone calls and messages. And, you know, your dad meant this to me. Your dad meant that to me. Your dad did this for me. Your dad. And I hear those messages, and I'm seeing as I'm studying this passage this week, in my, in, our, in my own life. And I hope that you can say in your life, who I am today is not who I was 10 years ago. And it's not because there's any good thing in me. It's because God's been working. And he's been conforming me. And, he's, and maybe the mouth I used to have, I no longer have. The anger I used to carry, maybe it's still there in traffic in Houston, but I'm working on that, you know. Maybe when someone moves the remotes and you can't find the time to turn the TV on at home. And, sorry. <laughs> a, little, a little too personal there. But he's called us out of that. He's called us into the son who he loves. The son is the image of God, the firstborn. Now, we've got to be very clear on this word. I've mentioned this numerous times. That word is prototokos. We hear that word literally. There's something called semantic range of what words can mean. Words are not direct one-to-one, -one, what it means, what it says, the word here, and what it means. We know the word, for example, uh, a yard. That can mean your front yard, your backyard, your side yard. It can mean 36 inches. It can mean a lot of things. He ran for 36 yards. We know that one word has multiple meanings. And a lot of words do that in language called semantic range. What does this one word mean in total? Now, you got to make understand what the word means. Specifically, you take it in context of the sentence, in context of the paragraph, in context of the book of the Bible, in context of the entire Bible. So when it says he's the prototokos, and it said he's been with the Father forever, he's always been in existence, John chapter 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything was created by Him. Nothing that was created without Him was not created. Everything created was created by Him. So we know that He was always in existence, this man named Jesus. This, this Son was always in existence. So prototokos, Greek, or in, translated in English, firstborn, does not mean firstborn relationship-wise. It means firstborn positionally-wise. Who he was positionally. You remember David, and we mentioned this a few weeks ago in a different scenario, I believe. It said David was considered firstborn. Now, we know that David was the youngest of, I think, eight brothers. But yet he was considered firstborn. So we see that that word is used positionally, not relationship of who's chronologically firstborn, but who is the father saying this is the firstborn, the position of firstborn. And I want to make that clear because people, there's a big myth that Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, and the God of the New Testament is a stronger God than the God of the Old Testament, 
and the God of the Old Testament is judgment, and the God of the New Testament is love, they're the same God. Well, but he, you, say, you said he was born 2,000 years ago. He showed up in earth in the flesh 2,000 years ago, but he existed prior to the beginning. He's, eternally, he's existed. He just showed up here 2,000 years ago. If someone were to walk in the room, none of us would say, oh, they just popped into existence all of a sudden. But the, the, the God of this world, the devil, has blinded people to the truth. And so when they say, well, Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, that's when Jesus came into existence. That is incorrect. As a matter of fact, Old Testament, I, I used to know this verse out of my head. I don't know right now, but where it's location. You can, it's Googleable later. But it says, all this God that made this and did that, and the mountains went up, and the valleys went down, and the seas were created. And can you tell me his name and the name of his son? That's in the Old Testament. They had this notion there's a son of, of God. Tell me his name and the name of his son. Now, 2,000 years after the cross, we can tell you his name is Jehovah, his son's name is Jesus. That's the name that they asked for thousands of years ago before Christ showed up. The son existed then. So he is the firstborn over all creation. This is who he is. He is positionally over everything. Why? Because in verse 16, for in him... All things were created. Everything in heaven, everything below heaven, everything visible, everything invisible was created by him. In verse 16, whether it be rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We are created for him. And he is, and I love this, that all these things that it just mentions, it's like they saved the best for life. In the, in the, the Holy Spirit revealed his information to Paul to write down. Look what he puts, like the, one of his, I don't want to be heretical here or blasphemous anyway, but what I could, as I'm reading this, I can almost consider he saved the best for last. Christ, what would you say you are? I'm the head of the church. One of my most prized titles, I think, is husband of Kelly. You have a lot of titles. But husband to Kelly is one that I really consider valuable to me. So here it says that Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, and again we see this word firstborn, and he's the firstborn from among the dead. Who is he positionally ruler over? All the living, he is positionally firstborn over all the dead. He is the ruler over everyone that lives and everyone that dies. That means everybody. I, I think you're either living or dead. There's no one between. So he's, he's firstborn over everything and everyone so that in everything, Christ might have the supremacy. That word supremacy, it's also maybe some of your translations say preeminent. I have this in my notes here. Uh, it's not in the translation of my Bible, the words, but I will say this. A lot of Christians today make Christ prominent. He's important to them. But there's a difference between the word prominent and preeminent. Prominent means he's important to me. Preeminent means he's the most important thing to me. More important than sleeping in on Sunday. More important than my finances. More important than my education. More important anything this world has to offer. Is he just important or is he most important? And there's a difference between preeminent and prominent. And I would encourage you to maybe analyze in your own walk and there's nothing wrong if you've done this. I'll tell you as your, as your pastor, I have done this in my life. I've looked back and said, oh, God, you were very important. But at that window of my life, this, by my time and monies and energies and thoughts, forgive me, Lord, but there was something more important than you. Because I kept other things more important in my mind and in my finances and in my personal life than you. You were important, but you were not the most important. And in, and in this walk and the sanctification process, we move towards this situation where one day we come to the conclusion, Jesus, you have to be supreme. We will all say this with our words. But what does our money, what does our time, what do our thoughts, what do our words say? What do our actions say, more importantly? Because what speaks louder than words? Our actions. And God's going to look at what we're doing. Blessed are those that hear the word, but even more so, those that do the word. 
Blessed are the doers of the word and not the hearers only. So we can say, and, and folks, I will tell you, the devil's tricky. He'll make an image in your mind of your Christian walk, and you're, you'll say, you know, I'm as good as they can come. I'm so moral, and I'm so righteous, and I'm so... Folks, I wake up every morning, dear Lord, forgive me a sinner. I come humbly before your grace. I ask for your protection today. When I set foot out of this bed and my foot hits the ground, Lord, protect me, because I know the devil is walking around like a roaring lion, laying traps. And, and Lord, I'm still in this stuff called flesh, and this flesh is pretty sinful. Lord, I need your protection through my day. Till I lay my head back down tonight, walk with me. As we said in Psalm 34 a week or two ago, let your angels encamp round about me. Don't open the door. Don't let me get involved with. Help me be cautious and have discernment for Satan's traps in my life. I want to grow and be closer and be conformed more and more and more. And I know that sin can break that process. It doesn't break the relationship as your son, but it breaks the process of sanctification. It doesn't break salvation. That's done forever. But it can break this, this goal I have of moving forward in my sanctification. Protect me today because I'm weak. You're in trouble when you say, Satan can't control me. I can do what I want. If you say that, say, but say, because of Christ. I would add those words. It's not you and your strength. It's because of Christ in you. And so praise him for that. So uh, in everything, he might be, have supremacy in verse 18. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That concept, fullness, that word there is only used twice in the Bible where it says the fullness dwell in him. It was used here, it was used, I think, in Corinthians when, at Mars Hill when Paul was talking. But uh, that word is unique in that if someone were to say, we've said, we're trying to, I'm trying to say today the importance of Christ, the prominence, the preeminence of Christ. But if someone in the world today were to say, who is God? If you've been in church for a while, you'd say, he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, he's uh, um, um, all knowledge, all powerful, he's everywhere, he's omni, all these omnis, he's all these things. But if you had to put one word, and they said, what's this one word to describe God? The Greek thought process was fullness. That's what we translate this word that's used twice here in the New Testament. God is, he's too big for one word. So we just have to say the completeness. He's everything. And that's this word fullness has a very technical theological concept to even to the Greeks 2,000 years ago. It was when they would talk about God, his, his completedness. And, and this is something else I want you to think real quick. I know we're not in a systematic theology class. God, the reason our Bible tells us God can never change, is God always perfect? Is he always in a perfect state of being? So if he ever moved to become a perfect state of being, that means at one time he was not perfect. He's always been perfect. Can he ever change? Can anything be added to make him more perfect? That's why it says there is no change in him. If he changes from perfect, if he changes more perfect, that means he at one time he wasn't perfect. In our sense of the word perfect, perfection. So he cannot change. He's always eternally not only existed, he's always eternally always been perfect. There's nothing we can do to add to him. There's nothing we can do to take away from him. There's nothing he will do to add to himself or take away because once he changes from that state of absolute being perfect, then he no longer is. So, so how can he be all these things to all people? Because he's the fullness. He's the completedness of perfection. And he shares that completedness of perfection with us. How can a complete, perfect, eternal, infinite spirit share himself with mere mortal men made of flesh? Impossible until Jesus Christ was born. He is the complete image, the full image, the perfect representation of the Father. He's so perfect, he said, in my love and in my perfectness, I have to share this with something. If I was just perfect and kept it to myself, I would be, that wouldn't be perfect. I've got to share my perfect and my love with something, and he created us humans. And we took that love and that gift and we went off into the kingdom of darkness. And he loves us so much, he said, I'm going to make a plan to bring you back to me. And the plan is the cross. And that's what our passage says here as we move forward. It says, God was pleased to have all fullness because there was this notion again, and I've heard this, and this is, 
I'm not going to say it's necessarily evil if someone says it, but I will say it's blasphemous. I'm going to give someone the, 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 the grace that maybe they don't understand. But I've heard people say, Jesus was a man like us, and he said, until his uh, baptism, and then when the Holy Spirit descended upon him, then he became perfect. Well, the best interpretation of the Bible, or commentary, is the Bible. And it says that Jesus was tempted just like us, but never sinned. So we can see when someone says he was perfect, I mean, he wasn't perfect until the Holy Spirit descended upon his baptism. That's not what it says here. What it says here is the fullness, the completeness of the Father was in Christ. The complete Father. Everything you know of the Father, we saw in Christ, Jesus, on this earth. The fullness of God dwelt in him. And there's two words you can use for dwell. We don't have a good example. The one, I would say, vacationing or camping you know, we have this notion of, hey, we went camping this weekend. You know they didn't stay there. That's a limited. Well, in Greek, they have this word dwelling like we would think it's temporary. This is permanent. This dwelling is he stayed there permanently. The fullness of God was always permanently in Christ Jesus. It was always it, the fullness dwelt in him. And through him, and this is the purpose now, what he, what he has done for us, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. When I do uh, either family counseling or marriage counseling, and I've said this, I think, from the pulpit before, I tell people right at day one, moment one, first time we come in, my goal is always reconciliation. There may be a time of separation in that process, depending on what's going on in a, between a husband and a wife situation. But my goal, I tell people, my goal is never to help you when someone comes and says, Give me, I need a good divorce attorney. I'm not your guy for that. That's not who I am. I will always come from the position of reconciliation. And if you're, you're bound and determined, you can do that, but I'm not going to help you down that road. It's not in me. I'm not saying you're wrong for doing it. I don't know your situation. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Maybe there's more at that first time, but I always tell them my goal will always be to restore your marriage under Christ. The spirit of reconciliation in our relationships. And so he says, uh, and that's because Christ does that. It says Christ came... Once you were, uh, in verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Now, I will tell you in people, reconciliation, sometimes both people kind of moving together. Notice it doesn't say reconcile us with him. It says reconcile us to him. And I don't know if your translation what it says, but God's not coming halfway over to sinful man. He's saying, I'm who I am. You have to come to me. How can we sinners come to a holy God? Somehow there's got to be a mechanism that makes us righteous and holy. And that mechanism is Jesus Christ and his cross. That is the method of us being able to be reconciled to God. Because without faith, and faith, we come to Christ through faith, without faith it's impossible to please a holy God. So we need a method of reconciliation that's not from us. Where's it going to come from? The only place it can come from is the Father. So the, the Father, it pleased the Father to put the fullness of himself, of God, the Father, into Christ Jesus for the purpose of reconciling all things to him whether things on earth or things in heaven and now you might be saying well what do you mean about these things in heaven are there powers that fly around remember in, in our words we have sky atmosphere and space in their words they have the heavens there's the first heaven which is where the birds fly there's the second heaven which is atmosphere uh in, in, in space, really space, not atmosphere, but that's the first heaven. Second heaven is space where the planets reside. And the third heaven is where God resides. It's just a different thinking of what heavens mean. So here when it says he's got to reconcile things of heaven, are there spiritual demonic powers flying around in our atmosphere right now? There are. There are spiritual entities, demonic entities flying around. We don't see them physically, but we know in the Bible they are there, the powers of the air in Ephesians. They're flying. And so when it says he's going to reconcile, you know, one day those demons will be cast out and, and they will be no more. So when it says even the nature, these storms we're having, I will tell you if Adam and Eve, specifically Adam, had not sinned, I don't know there would be flooding and tornadoes. Nature itself is disaster because of us. When sin entered the world, it ruined everything. Not just humanity. Everything was ruined. Nature was ruined. The atmosphere, the heaven. So it says the heavens will be reconciled. If you think about it in Revelation, when he comes back, he says, 
the old heavens and the old earth will pass away in a new heaven and earth. Everything's going to be changed. Even the heavens are not perfect and they're, they're corrupted by our sin. So it says that he's going to reconcile everything on earth and everything in heaven. And then we, what we have here is we have peace. And how do we have peace with God? Through his blood shed on the cross. So not only is what Jesus is, he's the perfect image of God with the fullness of God in him. Here's what he has done. He has reconciled everything and is reconciling, ongoing everything to him. And the mechanism for doing that, the, me the mechanism is the blood of his cross. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Blood had to be shed. What kind of blood? Perfect blood. No human being has perfect blood except one, Jesus Christ. And that perfect blood had to be shed for our forgiveness for our sins. His perfect blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, you were separated, you were foreign to holy God. You were enemies in your minds. And we know that from Romans 1. They knew God in their minds. They forsook him and they changed the truth of God for a lie. This was all of us. Once you were alienated, separated from God, and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. When I hear people say, well, I don't sin. Well, yes, you do. You just did. You just lied. You know? And why? Because we like sin. It says your evil behavior separated you. Your evil behavior separated you. But now, but now, he's writing to the church at Colossae, Christian believers. But now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So what we've seen here is Christ is God, he's man, he's the creator, and he's the sustainer of everything. That's who he is. Should that entity that we know as Jesus Christ be worthy of our praise and that he's God, he's man, he's creator, and sustainer. Everything is kept together because of him. That alone should make us praise him. But then not only in these last passages, not only these last passages, he's not only those things, he's a reconciler. He has brought us into God's presence through his shed blood. He is our redeemer. So Christ's relationship to the creation of the world, he created everything. Christ's relationship to the reconciliation of the church is in this passage, every area of life, every area of creation touched by the sin of man must be touched by the grace of God. And that's what it's saying here. Every corruption by our sin and all creation is to be touched by the grace of God. And that's what Christ's mission was, and that's the mission he brings us as co-laborers, that we go into the earth, to all the earth, preaching the gospel. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. That's the only mechanism that brings reconciliation to God the Father, is that we accept Christ shed blood on the cross, he died for our sins, he was buried and he rose again. That is, I said it again a moment ago, I'll say it again, that is the only mechanism for rec reconciliation with God the Father. There is no other way of reconciliation. There's one and only one mediator between God the Father and sinful man. And that mediator, that go-between, is the man Christ Jesus. So it says, why do you worship Christ? Why is he so important to you? Why is he preeminent in your life? Because what he's done for creation, what he's done for my redemption. There's no one else but Jesus Christ that can do these things. And that's why Christ and Christ alone was given a name above all names. The name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. One day, Jesus Christ, you are Lord of all. Shouldn't we just start saying that now while we're still here in the flesh? We're going to be saying it one day. One day we will see Satan kneel down and say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord of all. Every demon will kneel. And every demon will confess, you Christ are Christ alone. And you are Lord of all. And now we will exit stage left to the pit of eternal damnation where you're sending us. That will happen. Folks, don't be part of that group. Be part of the sheep that he separates the goats from the sheep. 
And today is the day of your salvation. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, and I don't know, I heard there was some sound stuff that we're hopefully we're broadcasting, but whether we are or not, if, if, if you are watching, now we're in the future. Today is the day of salvation. Something so simply, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Reconcile me, forgive me, cover me in the shed blood of your cross. Something from the heart so simply said to God, anyone that calls on the name of Christ will be saved. Everyone that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Jesus, forgive me. I say it so often, and it bears repeating today, the thief on the cross, remember me. It wasn't the words, it was the heart attitude. And any human, no matter how much sin you've had, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, the shed blood of Christ on the cross is superior to your sin. And where you sin, grace abounds more. You cannot out -sin God's grace. But you have to be willing to receive God's grace to get it. And that receiving God's grace is through faith, not by works that you've done, but only according to grace by your faith are you saved. God, forgive me, a sinner. Just like that, you're translated. That word a moment ago it says you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. When a king 2,000 years ago would come in, and maybe even today to some degree, we saw it in ancient Israel with uh, the Hittites and the Babylonians, and uh, even in Daniel's time with the Babylonians, that when a kingdom would conquer another kingdom, they would take the people and translate them and say, you are no longer a citizen of Israel, you are now a citizen of Babylon. And they would transfer and translate those people out of this kingdom into this kingdom. That's the imagery we're being shown here. You've been translated, transferred out of that kingdom. You are no longer a citizen of this world. You are no longer a citizen of the devil. You are a citizen of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ Most High, the highest that's ever existed, Lord of all. That's who we're citizens of. And that's who we're ambassadors to this world of. Praise God. And that's who Jesus is. If, if, you, if we continue in our faith, established and firm, we do not move from the hope of the gospel. This is the gospel you've heard and is proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So Paul closes with um, the gospel message. He says right there in the closing, all this is to the gospel who I'm a servant of. Every one of us in here, if you're a believer, you are called to share the gospel. You may not be called to be in the choir or the praise team or a Sunday school teacher or to preach. Maybe you are. Maybe you're called to be a missionary. I don't know. You are called wherever you are to preach the gospel and to proclaim Christ to this world. No matter if you say you're a grocery clerk, checking out people's groceries, or if you're a ditch digger, if you're cutting, it doesn't matter what you do or what you are. You are first and foremost an ambassador of Jesus Christ to this earth. And the ambassadors share the message. And Paul here says of this message, I have become a servant. If you are a believer, maybe that's your goal is, Lord, help me have a uh, a, a spirit of soul winning. Maybe you say, well, that's not in me. I'm ashamed. I'm afraid. I don't know all the answers. Folks, I can't tell you enough. You don't, I don't know if anyone has all the answers except God. There's no theologian in this world that knows this book completely frontwards and backwards and all the, the depths and the richness of the glories of Christ given in this book. One lifetime can't contain it. One mind can't contain it. None of us have all the answers. Here's what you can say. Here's who I was before Christ. Christ showed up and here's who I am today. He's changed me. He can change you. I will close with, with just a real brief story, and if you'll give me a little latitude on this one. Fifteen years ago, I think I've shared this before, my dad was dying. and his, his eye, He's got a glass eye in one eye, his other eye, the, the black turned gray. The, he was in the hospital, the blue line on him. The nurses came in. They started doing stuff. They resuscitated him back to life. And um, they said, if you don't get a pacemaker, you're going to die. And, and my dad said, I'm ready to go. This was 15 years ago. And he said, I'm ready to go. I'm tired. I'm, I'm happy. I know where I'm headed. My mom said, Dale, go and talk to your dad. You're the only one he's going to listen to. Tell him to get the pacemaker. I went and said, Dad, look, you know, I get it. You're, you're 70 years old, middle life. But if you're ready to go, I know you're tired. You've had a hard life. You're beat up. Finger missing, glass eyes, steel in your knees, hips, shoulders, back, you know, multiple surgeries had a hard life. I get it. You're tired. But when you get to heaven, 
Do you want to say, hey, Lord, it's me, I quit? Or do you want to say, Jesus, I gave every last breath that I had? Don't worry about what the world says or what our family says. You do what you think when you stand before God, where you, how you want to stand. Give me the pacemaker. I'll stay. And I've seen him walk down prison walls. Tom Oliver, if you're there Saturday, Tom Oliver's a good friend of his. He's the one that gave us the Bibles. All those Bibles, that's Tom Oliver. Him and my dad, best friends. He, my dad asked him to do the eulogy. But, Tom, but we used to do a lot of prison ministry together. And I've seen my dad walk down a hall, breathing. He had congestive heart failure, and his heart was down to 25%. He, his heart wouldn't speed up. It was on a rhythm meter. Pouring sweat, can't breathe. Bibles in this hand, kneeling on the wall in this hand, you know, struggling. I said, Dad, just, just go home and rest. I'll rest when I die. The last words out of my mouth, I want to have someone to come to Christ. I want to say Jesus loves you. Two days before he died, Nurse Dawn, hospice nurse, is now a believer. Nurse Dawn came in. They started talking. My dad said, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done for me. And as she's doing the hospice care nurse work and doing stuff with them and do it to them and bringing a hospice bed and doing all that stuff. He just started pouring out about what Christ has done. And Nurse Dawn kneeled down, Lord, forgive me a sinner. That's not just my dad. That's a brother in Christ that I admire. That's a brother in Christ that you have. We have such a cloud of witnesses watching us while we're here. We have time now to work in the mission fields. One day, Christ will return and he'll call us home and there will be no more time to work in the mission field. Then our work will be done. Use your time wisely, because the fields are white unto snow. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for, first and foremost, your son, Jesus Christ. I dread to think where we would be without him. Father, we lift up those in our community that are lost, they're going through the pain and suffering and confusion and chaos of this world without your son. It's hard for us that have and are translated into the kingdom of light. I can't imagine the, 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 the disaster they're going through without Christ and without a living hope. Father, we lift them up now and we ask you to use this church and the members of this church to, to plant those seeds and the water and to, and to share the gospel message with the lost. Father, keep continuing to conform us in the image of your Son. Keep reconciling us and redeeming. Uh, re you've redeemed us, but keep sanctifying us and getting us more and more conformed. Father, forgive us where we fail. You help us to focus on the seriousness of this walk we have and the, and the importance we have as ambassadors of the King of Kings here on this earth. Help us not turn one step to the left or one step to the right but fully and wholly follow you perfectly on the path you've provided and set for us. Father, there's someone here today that is struggling. We ask you to just comfort them and give them peace. Give them peace in the midst of a storm they may be going through. We know you are the Prince of Peace. Let them know they have a church family, brothers and sisters that love them dearly. And more importantly, you love them dearly. Father, be with us as we leave today. Let us go home safely and securely. Father, this week we ask for divine appointments that we might plant that seed or share the gospel with someone, even this week. In Jesus' name we pray.